So um, let's get started. I'm going to go to the first slide. Um, oh, that's just the title. I'll go to the next one, and yep, that's me. And I have uh, built my career on financial planning. I think that a plan is the most important thing to start with. Um, so this slide talks about why learn about finance. So, you know, the term finance might seem um, kind of sophisticated, but really it's, it's about your money and your life. And so, of course, you need to learn about it, and you need to learn what um, particular to you uh, is the best path to go down. And, and how you do that is, you know, here it says uh, in, increase your financial literacy so you can use your money more efficiently. You know, you can read online. You can go on uh, many websites or CNN Money. Um, you can also use simple investing books. There's Investopedia, uh, which I find to help, particularly with jargon for people that are just starting out. But uh, above all, knowledge is power. Once you uh, start reading about um, finance or, or your, your money matters, uh, you're going to feel more comfortable. And um, I think that's the first place to start is just doing a little bit of, 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 of reading and um, both on the web and also in there's plenty of books that you can go to the public library and get on uh, Investing 101. Um, you do need to empower yourself to make uh, these informed decisions. Make your own decisions. Make your own decisions after you research and asking questions. Um, ask the help of a professional. Uh, I think the biggest mistake is people delegate all investment and financial decisions um, to other people. and you're going to be the one left holding the bag. If you don't learn about your finances, particular to you and your needs and your goals, um, you're really you're the one that's going to be left holding the bag. So you really do need to make your own decisions. Do not delegate this to somebody else. You can confer with other people, trusted individuals, but the ultimate decision has to be yours, and you have to be comfortable making that decision after doing some research. Um, this next uh, item, begin to grow your wealth as early as possible. This is so important uh, because I can't stress this enough. I, I've done uh, hundreds and hundreds of plans for people. And some people will come to me in their late 50s and say, okay, I want to retire and we start to do the plan, and I realize they started so late in their uh, savings and investing. I can't stress enough, it takes so, so much less money to reach your goals, whether it be college, retirement, home buying, what have you, if you start early. So in other words, you know, somebody uh, starting in their 20s saving uh, has to save a fraction of what they need for the same end goal as somebody even in you know five or ten years later in their 30s. It is remarkable the power of investing early. It will hurt less in your pocket because you won't have to put out as much. Um, and even as you start out early, the earlier you start from your goals, uh, so whether it be a home or, or retirement, the more aggressive you can actually invest and because you're going to have a lot of time in the market. So the gyrations of the market won't affect you as much. Uh, there's lots of calculators online and tools. Um, one of them uh, may be titled uh, Cost of Waiting. Um, the Cost of Waiting basically is talking about how much less it costs you uh, to invest early and reach the same goals. It really hurts a lot less when you start early because it takes so much less money. Uh, let me go to the next slide is, um, okay, so financial lexicon. And this is that um, Investopedia. You can go on there. It's a, kind of like a dictionary of, of terms. But I'll go through these basic terms. Um, We'll start on the left with personal finance. So assets, 
uh, I'm sure most of you know what that is. That's any kind of asset that you have. It could be tangible or intangible. You know, I prefer clients to have assets that are appreciable as opposed to depreciating or at least the, the, the majority of their assets to be appreciating. You know, a lot of people will have cars and boats or what have you. These things depreciate in value, whereas real estate or, or um, homes or equities, hopefully, you know, stocks, those are appreciating. Those would be the intangibles, and tangibles would mean, you know, the homes and, and real estate and those types of things. Um, so, you know, building your assets a little at a time is a wonderful um, idea, but you want to try to have the majority of your assets in things that are appreciating. Uh, liabilities, we really want to keep these at a minimum. Uh, I, this is a really important factor. Certainly, you don't want to be going into retirement with massive liabilities because if you're earning less or earning none uh, at retirement, nothing, then you're really uh, going to drown um, from your liabilities. So you want to keep them at a minimum. Um, then that kind of goes right into debt, which debt is a liability. It's a type of a liability. But um, I say that you want to avoid consumer debt here because you have nothing to show for it. I mean, maybe you have a nice wardrobe, but rolling consumer debt, in other words, not paying your credit card at the end of the month is such a terrible idea. It just mounts, and that's not debt that works for you. So you think, well, how could debt work for you? Well, it could if it's a mortgage, because now you have a tangible asset that could appreciate in the long run. So you want to concentrate on debt that um, can work for you. So the debt is a liability, but if that debt is in the form of you know, a mortgage or even you know, student loan, a student loan, you are ascertaining an education that you know, hopefully, if done right, will earn you more um, money in the future. So you know, that's debt that works for you, does something for you. So net worth um, mostly should be growing from year to year. And the net worth is simply your assets minus your liabilities. So what are you really worth? Because your liabilities are a negative to what you're worth. So net worth, you should try to gradually grow your net worth from year to year. There may be years that you actually go down in net worth because you're utilizing whatever funds you saved um, for the purpose of a goal, whether it be to pay for college or a home purchase or a car. So there's going to be uh, downturns in your net worth from year to year, but hopefully those downturns are simply a result of you making purchase or investing in goals that you had previously set. So be smart about that as well. Uh, the next uh, term is portfolio. So portfolio refers to your investments, and that can include savings in a bank, CDs, savings bonds, treasuries, uh, stocks, all, all types of things. So the one thing I'll say about a portfolio, and it can start small, that's fine, is that you want to concentrate on an asset allocation. What does that mean? In other words, for you and for your age and for your goals and for your risk tolerance, meaning what you can stomach in the market, you want to have an asset allocation that is built for you. And there are a lot of tools online that you can use for this. So you, in other words, if you're one that can't sleep at night seeing the markets going up and down, then you, you want to keep the stock side of the portfolio maybe a little bit lower. Um, However, if you're young and you have a lot of years and earning potential, then maybe you want to be a little more aggressive with the stock side because you don't need that money for a long time. So portfolio is simply your investments. Um, and actually, you know, when I do financial planning, I include um, 
you know, in the wealth portfolio, I include tangible assets as well, including, uh, you know, cars or collectibles or uh, family heirlooms and those types of things. Uh, but when you're talking to people, um, most of the time when, they re- when they're when um, they referring to a portfolio, it's, it's simply their actual investments. 401k. This is a wonderful tool that if you have an opportunity in your company to take advantage of, you absolutely should. 401k, um, you know, many companies offer matching on your 401k. There's all different matches, but if you could, you should max out your 401k year over year And what that is, is they're taking money from your paycheck and investing it in a retirement account, and they take it out pre-tax. So in other words, you have more money working for you than if you were to take the money out, you know, a normal paycheck, you pay your income tax on it, and then invest the money, so you have a lot less to invest. So there are a couple of levels of uh, advantage on a 401k. There's, of course... Some companies match, as I mentioned earlier. Also, it lowers your income tax because it comes out pre-tax. Um, and they, you know, sometimes the options are limited. However, there's almost always a portfolio that you could choose called a target retirement portfolio. And generally, those are the you, you pick a year that you think you might be retiring, let's say 2030. And they manage the portfolio for you. And so as it gets closer to 2030, they may get more conservative because you may be taking the money out sooner um, you know, rather than later. But again, a 401k is an excellent option, pre-tax dollars going into a retirement account for you. Generally, you can't get the money out until you're 59 and a half, although there are exceptions, hardship or primary residence. And sometimes you can even take a loan against it if you'd like. Um, but you have to talk to your HR department about this. It's a wonderful fringe benefit for, for, for that company's offer. Uh, investing basics. So I'm sure most of you have heard of stocks or equities. You're, a, you're an owner, a shareholder of the company. So ABC company and what have you, um, generic company, and you are an owner of the company. So that means you have a share of the company. And if the company does well, the stock could go up. If a company doesn't do so well, the stock can go down. So you certainly want to get some professional advice or you can do the research yourself. However, you know, um, there is an art to that and a science. And so um, you do want to try and get some advice on that. Bonds, you're a creditor, so they owe you the money back with interest. And so if the company goes under, you could lose your money if the company actually goes bankrupt, but that's the only way. If the stock goes down, that doesn't matter. They still owe you that money, and they still will pay their interest and they will come due, so you may put ten thousand dollars in for five years, get uh, you know two or three percent, whatever the interest rate is, the prevailing interest rate, and then at the end per year, and then at the end you get your money back. Bonds are considered to be less risky. Um, commodities. So this is gold or oil or any you know, sugar, coffee, cocoa. All of those are considered commodities, and they are considered to be very volatile. However, they consider those hedge, those are hedges on a portfolio because generally um, it's to hedge against inflation. Um, those are the things that go up in value quite a bit when there's inflation. Um, this shouldn't be a large percentage of anybody's portfolio, really. Um, kind of rule of thumb is maybe 5% in a commodity mutual fund or um, something like that. Um, Equity is is really the same thing as as stock. Um, that's what we refer to as equities. I mean, there's another term, maybe an equity in a company, an equity ownership, but that's in fact, you know, just like a stock of a publicly traded company. 
um, mutual funds, there's over 9,000 mutual funds in the universe. And it could be bonds, it could be stocks, or it could be a combination. Um, there's so many different variations on mutual funds. Um, many people like to use a balanced fund, so it could be a combination of bonds and stocks. And you can go online to see historically the returns of these mutual funds, how they've done, and you want to take particular attention to watching these funds during, you know, uh, kind of downturns in the economy to see how they behaved. Uh, and that's just a little research. You just look up the mutual fund. Um, there's lots of tools online for you to check their um, their historic returns, and you can see the charts on them to see how they behaved in all kinds of markets. And and that's likely an option that's going to be offered to you in a 401k is mutual funds. Um, the next item, the Dow Jones, I'm sure everybody here is, you know, the Dow was up, the Dow was down, et cetera. The Dow Jones, believe it or not, is only 30 stocks. It's an index of 30 of the largest stocks, and the stocks sometimes do change that are in there. So it gives a bit of the direction. Uh, you know, obviously when people say the Dow was up or the Dow was down, that's really only 30 stocks. But more or less that indicates the direction of the market. Um, what's actually more encompassing is the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 is an index as well, but it's of 500 stocks. So it covers a much broader universe um, and many people in our field actually follow the S&P a little more closely than the Dow Jones. So let's go on to the next slide. Well, this is probably not news to anybody on this call, income inequality. I, I, a funny story is I have three daughters, 13, 15, and 17, and my 15-year-old came home uh, about a week or two weeks ago and said, Mom, did you know that women make about 75 to 78 cents on the dollar? And um, I said, sure, I know. And she said, well, what are we going to do about it? So obviously this number has been ascending, but it's you know troubling for women investors because it's true, this does happen with salaries. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that um, we've been told, but you know, number one reason is that, uh, you know, uh, it's been traditionally like this, and it's on the ascent, and hopefully it will continue and will be at parity uh, one day. But um, the thing about this is that because of that, you know, women have to be particularly diligent about saving and investing early. And we do have fewer working years at times because we may be um, – taking time off for caregiving, as indicated here, for either parents or children, raising our children. So uh, missing out on those years of earning ultimately um, has you missing out as a woman on savings. So, for example, let's say t take 401K, for instance. You know, if you're working and earning and you're doing your 401K, you're saving. But if you take a few years off or how many years off to raise your children, those years you're not contributing to your 401K. That 401K is not, you know, uh, it's, a, it's an actual retirement account for you individually. So now your individual 401K is less than somebody else's that continue to work all those years. So I tell most of my women clients, as soon as you start working, Put as much away as you can. The earlier the better because there will be years that you may take off for caregiving or, um, you know, or, or, or a number of reasons that we may take off and then come back to the workforce. So earlier, the more you can put away earlier, the better to try and compensate for not only the reduced wage but also the fact that you might be taking time off uh, from your career. So how do I get started? Um, you know, for clients, I like to use something uh, that I refer to as a family records organizer, which is precisely, you know, uh, what is indicated on this slide. You know, you can use a simple binder, a loose leaf binder with tabs, and I would keep it electronically as well. Um, but 
you want to have all your personal medical and health information, uh, you know, the legal documents, all of this insurance policies. You want to make sure you check your insurance policies each year to make sure they're in force. You get a statement annually on them. You want to make sure uh, you can even call the insurance company and ask them for what's called an in-force illustration, and that just shows you that it's still intact. Um, and depending on the type of insurance, you know, what the premiums will be. Um, there are sometimes insurance policies that you can skip a premium, but you, every policy is different, and that in-force illustration will show you that. Um, the leases and the mortgages, key to keep an eye on the rate. There's been phenomenal opportunity the last three, four years in the markets for refinancing mortgages. And um, so you want to keep an eye on that. And with regard to leases, um, sometimes, you know, um, landlords will offer a reduced rate if you sign, you know, two-year lease, et cetera. So you can look into those opportunities if you think you're going to be there for a while. So you you want to keep those in the binder, but you do want to keep an eye on them. And, of course, your bank statements. It's never been easier to balance your checkbook because it's all online. Um, you know, and actually bank statements, you know, you can usually go back two to three years online, but certainly the older statements, then you have to order them from your bank. So you definitely want to keep, you know, at least the year-end statement for the year's past ones and then the current statements just to make sure you're balancing. And you can see trends, by the way, in your bank statements um, and, uh, and credit card statements if you have them. Um, you can see trends. Uh, how you're spending and how much, you know, maybe you're spending more during a season. you got to keep an eye on that. So um, I urge you to keep an eye on that as well. And if you have it all in one place, you're likely, you're more likely to, to, to look at it. And then passwords to all accounts. You want to keep this in a really safe place. Um, the, the electronic version, password protected, and then the actual version, maybe you want to leave it for your loved ones to make sure. You know, I also tell people to include their will and uh, all important legal documents and have it all together. What are your financial objectives? And everybody is different. So you have to identify um, your goals and define them. So it could be college, it could be retirement, home purchase, it could be a car, it could be paying off my student loans, it could be anything. The first thing in any uh, plan that I do is I ask them what their expenses are and their goals, and their wants and needs. That's what we can call them, wants and needs. So you want to write these things out and the year that you think you want to hit this goal. And you're going to look ahead. This is why you're going to look ahead 5, 10, 20 years. I mean, it's really hard to do that, but if you have a general category or you know that you know you want to do and then in the next 5, 10 years, you're going to write it down. You have to start with a plan. Um, you want to create a, a manageable budget. It has to be realistic. It really does. I think people make budgets and they're not realistic. I always put a little extra, you know, cushion in people's budgets because they say, you know, oh no, I never spend that much. And then if I look at their returns and I look at their, uh, you know, credit uh, card statements or bank statements, you know, I always say, you know, you under underestimated. Uh, um, in your budget, you want to pay yourself first believe it or not. So that could be in the form of your 401k. That's a good savings. You can also pay yourself, you know, with after-tax dollars and put that in a savings account. And you really want to have, um, and this goes to the prepare for the unexpected, two items down. You want to have at least three months worth of expenses in cash. And, and the reason you want to do that is if you have a nice portfolio and it's growing and, and, and you need to liquidate because of something that went you know, wrong in your life, an emergency, you don't want to have to liquidate investments in a bad market. You want to let those investments grow. So you have to have a cushion, and that's got to be built into the budget. So think beyond the purchases to future milestones, which is what we talked about before, which is college, you know, retirement, and all those things. And um, 
you know, the assets that you try to ascertain as you get on in your uh, plan, you want to try and get those that are not depreciable, like I said before. Um, plan for retirement. So it's funny, uh, in my office, there are a lot of the younger people that, um, you know, retirement is, you know, so far off they can't even see it. And I understand that. But if you start early, again, it's the smaller amounts. It's it's so much cheaper, and it grows so big so much sooner, and um, that's the best way for you to plan for retirement, either utilizing a 401k or an IRA account. Uh, you do get if you don't participate in a 401k at your job because they don't offer it or you chose not to, you do get to deduct depending on your taxes, you have to talk to your accountant, but you do get to deduct an IRA contribution. Look, everybody's going to retire one day. And so, you know, the sooner you start saving, um, the cheaper it is and the more aggressive you can be in your investing. Um, it will be, it may be more volatile, but because you have so many years, if you're in a you know, a good portfolio that is well managed, which those target funds are, you know, um, it will be well worth it because the more volatile, obviously, the more upside there is too. So who will you partner with? You definitely want to build a team you trust. Um, you want a friend or a family member that, you know, you can just bounce ideas off of and maybe you can you know there's a lot of investment clubs and things uh you know um you want to try and get a professional financial advisor that look for designations ask for referrals from them designation could be certified financial planner um and those types of things you want to have an accountant and a, or a tax attorney sometimes they're combined uh a, a CPA you want to be able to bounce ideas off of all of them um, and have access to them, even if it's just on email. I, I think it's really important to get the professional advice. This is what we do all day long. We've studied this in school, and it, finance can be complex um, it, if it's not um, kind of uh, pulled apart and looked at individually. And it's hard for just the, you know a person that hasn't been in finance at all to do that alone. I, I think the team is, is a, a big part of um, your ultimate decision making. You have to ultimately make, make the decisions. Um, and with that said, the professional team definitely should communicate clearly and explain concepts and strategy and not uh, make you feel bad about having to explain these things. Uh, they should answer all questions. No question is stupid. I hear that all the time, and particularly from our female clients. They say, oh, I have a stupid question, and kind of apologetically. And I say, it's actually stupid to not ask if you don't understand something. So no question is stupid, because if you don't know it and you don't understand it, you definitely have to ask those questions. Um, so I think that's it, Maggie, that I had on the slides, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we can open it up to Q&A now. Okay, great. Okay, so we had some questions come in during the webinar. Um, and the first one we have here is, when is it a good time to start investing in the stock market? We've read about the sharp increase in the market mm -hmm. since the election. Is now a good time to invest? Well, um, we touched on this a little bit. It is always a good time to start planning for your financial future. The first step is to determine your objectives, your time frame for achieving those objectives, and the level of risk you're willing to accept. I mean, the next step for most people, most investors, is to create a balanced, diversified portfolio. Uh, regular investment, even on a monthly or perhaps quarterly basis of roughly the same amount of money is called dollar cost averaging. So you're going in uh, monthly. Uh, this method can help avoid the need to try and time the market, and it will take advantage typically of market volatility. Of course, any type of continuous or periodic investment plan 
doesn't really assure profit and does not protect against loss in declining markets. So since such a plan involves continuous investment in securities or uh, regardless of fluctuating price levels, et cetera, I mean, the, the investor should really consider his financial ability to continue uh, purchases through periods of low price uh, levels. So even if the markets are down, the dollar cost averaging has to continue. Um, Okay. I think there's other opportunities in the market today. There's always opportunities. If you do your research and enlist the help of others and experienced advisor, I mean, you'll find opportunities. Okay. Thank you. Another question we have for you is, is there a rule of thumb for choosing stocks or should I just invest in companies that interest me? Everyone says, do your research. What should I be looking for? Well, there's really no rule of thumb because two individuals are really not alike. Um, everyone has their own financial objectives. I mean, are you looking for immediate income? If so, you might want to consider equities with a strong history of, of, of solid dividends. Uh, are you investing for a retirement that's maybe 30 years off? You know, if so, maybe dividends aren't your priority, but long-term capital appreciation, a growth company. There are a number of resources available to help screen for stocks that meet um, criteria, individuals' criteria. Of course, you know, working with an experienced financial advisor will save you a lot of time and energy because this is what they do on a daily basis. Uh, you know, nevertheless, if you're working on your own, questions to ask include some of these. Um, what's the company's history of profit growth or revenue growth? Uh, are the company insiders buying or selling the firm's equities, the CEOs or the CFOs? And, and that's all public information. And uh, do you believe in the company's products? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, another question here is, I have a 401k at work. Is it a good idea to increase my contribution to the maximum the employer will allow, even with the limits on investment choices? We touched on this a little bit earlier, too. And, 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 and yes, if you can afford to give up the immediate cash, absolutely yes. It's a it's a great idea to contribute at least as much as will be matched by your employer, uh, and you can get that information from your employment. Um, but keep in mind, however, that most people can't um, get the invested money out until retirement, uh, uh, you know, without penalties. So it is a retirement savings vehicle. Um, this is a particularly important investment vehicle for those without a, a company pension plan, which most people don't have these pension plans any longer. Okay. All right. And this is the last question we have for you. When I draw up a monthly budget, what is an ideal ratio for spending, saving, and investing? Okay. Um, so many advisors suggest that your monthly rent or mortgage payment should be no more than about 30% of your monthly take-home pay. Uh, you know, banks use that criteria too for mortgages, et cetera. You know, I believe it's a good idea to have maybe two to three months worth of living expenses in an easily accessible account for use in an emergency, which we mentioned earlier, cash on hand. And then for those starting their career, now's the perfect time to get in the habit of saving and investing. If you automatically set aside a certain percentage or your take-home pay and pay yourself first, you know, you will quickly become accustomed to not having that amount available for you know what otherwise you might spend on on friz frivolous expenditures or items that are you know things that you don't need okay all right well i want to thank you suzanne for a really great presentation thanks for taking the time to explain finance 101 to us and thanks to everyone who joined us today and asked questions we hope you'll be joining us again so thank you again so much suzanne thank you it was Bye -bye. a pleasure Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.